Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual planetarium from the Museum of Science in Boston. My name is Emily, my pronouns are she and her, and I will be your moderator during this program. So that means that if you are watching us in Zoom, you are welcome to ask questions or make comments throughout the program by using the Q&A button that you see on your screen. And everything that you put in that Q&A box, uh, I will be able to see it, and then I will relay those messages to our main educators. Also, we do offer live captions during the program, so if you would like to see captions, you can click on the See, see button on your screen and select Show Subtitles. So with that, we can welcome our main educators and get started. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I will uh, be doing most of the talking for the presentation, but I can't do it alone. Hello, everybody. My name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and today I'm going to be controlling the visuals for Katie. Awesome. Uh, so last week, if you tuned in, you heard uh, Talia talking all about various asteroid missions that are coming up uh, later this year um, and also in 2022. So those are all super exciting. And the general theme for this month is upcoming missions. Um, so asteroids, super cool. But today we are going to be talking about the highly anticipated Artemis program. So the Artemis program is a series of missions uh, that is the first of which is set to launch at the end of this year. It There's a good chance that it might get pushed, um, but we'll talk about that. Uh, so it's a series of missions for sending eventually people back to the moon. Um, the first couple of missions won't be uh, landing on the moon, but the third one is going to bring uh, the next people to the moon, including the first woman and the first person of color to the surface of the moon, which is super, super exciting. And they're going to be landing in the lunar South Pole region. Um, we'll talk about why that's such a good spot uh, for them to land a little bit later on, but that's going to be the destination. This is a collaboration between NASA as well as commercial partners, especially SpaceX, as well as many international partners. Um, we'll learn about the Lunar Gateway Space Station as well. Uh, that's kind of a part of this Artemis program that will be a collaboration between nations similar to the International Space Station. Um, and we also have the components of the actual rocket and the spacecraft itself, the Orion capsule, the space launch system, and uh, the lunar gateway. So we can show you a diagram uh, of what this looks like. So basically all of the Artemis missions are going to be using the space launch system, which is the, the rocket that you're looking at right now, which is composed of uh, the core stage there. There's an upper stage as well as two solid rocket boosters. This is the most powerful rocket ever created. Um, it is enormous. It's bigger than a football field. And I think the whole thing weighs around 6 million pounds. Um, it's, it definitely beats the, the Saturn V in terms of power. And I think like 5.2 million pounds of that 6 million pounds is all fuel. Um, and then right at the top there, we've got the Orion spacecraft, which is, if you think about like the Apollo missions, the command module where the astronauts were living, that is uh, what Orion is doing for Artemis. And the last time, the whole Artemis program is really exciting because it's the first time that humans are going back to the moon since the Apollo program. And Artemis, they chose the name Artemis because Artemis in mythology is the twin sister of Apollo and sending the first woman to the moon. It's just kind of cool and it works out really well. Um, so that's kind of another tidbit here. All right, so this is the general structure of all of the various Artemis missions. They're all gonna be using Orion spacecraft as well as the space launch system. So let's dive into uh, the first mission, Artemis One. 
So this is the mission that is supposed to launch later this year. I believe the date right now is December 16th, although there is a good chance that that is going to be delayed. Um, to sometime in 2022. And as a matter of fact, most of the missions that we're talking about today are probably going to be delayed uh, at least by like a year or two um, just due to the pandemic, as well as some kind of inter political issues like with the commercial partners and things like that. So we'll we'll talk about those, but fingers crossed that they do launch uh, soon because I'm very excited selfishly. So this diagram is looks extremely complicated and it is. It's got every stage of this mission, but Artemis 1 at its core is going to be the first integrated flight of the Orion spacecraft and the space launch system rocket. So it's kind of like the first test flight, and this is going to be uncrewed. So no humans on board, and it's going to do a lunar flyby. And you can see its course there. It kind of makes like a figure eight um, shape on its way to the moon. This whole mission will last about uh, 26 days, I believe. And it's not just to you know, test Orion and the SLS, it is also going to be sending out CubeSats, which are, it's gonna have 13 uh, of these CubeSats, which are tiny satellites that are on board, kind of between where Orion is and the upper stage of the SLS. There's like this little adapter region. Yeah, Talia is pointing it out for us, that little slice there. Um, that is where all of these CubeSats are being housed, um, and this is a picture of it. And these are all just going to do lots of various science experiments um, that are really cool. There's one called BioSentinel, which is the only CubeSat that has any type of biological experiment planned. Uh, but it's going to be using yeast to detect, measure, and compare the impact of deep space radiation on living organisms over long durations. So past, uh, also past low Earth orbit, because there have been many experiments done on the International Space Station, um, as well as you know with animals or or microorganisms, as well as humans like a year in space, uh, all of that science was done using the International Space Station, which is still technically protected from a lot of the radiation from the sun because it's so close to the Earth. The International Space Station orbits about 250 miles above the Earth's surface. So that's still within a lot of the Earth's magnetic field. And so uh, those astronauts, they are getting exposed to more radiation than we are on the surface of the Earth, but it is still significantly less than what humans would experience going to the moon. So this is gonna tell us a lot about how radiation at that distance is going to affect living organisms. And eventually this will be applied to humans for future missions into deep space. Like if we ever wanted to send humans to Mars, um, this will be really important for developing, uh, you know, protections and, and ways to mitigate these particular dangers. Uh, so that's BioSentinel. Um, and I think we have like an illustration of it on the next page here. This is just a, an old kind of artist rendition of what that might look like. And this other one here is called the Lunar Flashlight. So this is another CubeSat that is going to use a laser to find water ice on the surface of the moon. Um, so basically it's gonna shoot a laser down to the surface and then that laser, the light will get reflected back off of whatever it lands on. And then a spectrometer on the CubeSat will basically say what that particular part of the surface is composed of. So it's going to be looking for water ice, which is really important for future missions because it's, you know, we need water for everything, for fuel to drink. Uh, it can be used to help astronauts breathe as well. There's all kinds of uses. And so having 
water already on the moon for astronauts and being able to use it is really important because that saves a lot of space, right? If you were sending all of that water needed for a long duration mission just on a rocket, it's going to take up a lot of space and space on the rocket is very valuable. So if there was a way to kind of harvest it from the moon and hopefully eventually Mars, uh, that, you know, that's the ideal situation. And honestly, I don't know if these missions would be possible without having uh, a source of water like that. Um, one other uh, CubeSat that I did not have on here, but it, it sounds really cool, is the NEA Scout, which is the Near Earth Asteroid Scout, which is another CubeSat. It's actually made up of six different CubeSats that will be deployed um, from Artemis 1, and it's going to approach an asteroid. The specific asteroid has not been decided yet. Um, that is to come because they're still not exactly sure when Artemis 1 is going to launch. Again, we said in December, but that is probably going to get pushed. So they still haven't chosen an asteroid just yet, um, but that will be uh, pretty interesting to have a CubeSat kind of go on its way to, to a near-Earth asteroid to investigate that. All right, so that's Artemis 1. Um, I will pause there and see if any questions have come in. Well, thank you, Katie. I do have a fun one in the Q&A box so far. It says, do either of you work at NASA? No, <laughs> I do not. Um, I am a volunteer, part of the NASA Solar System Ambassador Program. Um, so that has been really cool, staying up to date with NASA's missions and, and attending webinars and things like that and learning about a lot of the recent NASA news. So that's been really fun. I've also been able to participate in community outreach programs and um, put on programs for libraries and things like that um, through this volunteer program, but don't work for NASA. I will note though that the uh, museum and the planetarium in particular are um, frequent education partners with NASA. We often work with them on educational projects. That is very true. That's a good point. Nice. Thank you. Um, here's another one that just came in. Uh, is the moon egg-shaped? Oh, good question. Um, it is not, not really. It's pretty spherical. Yeah, if we look uh, in this view here, this is a program called NASA's Eyes, which is a free program. You can go online and you can download it, or you can even use some parts of it on the web. But it's a really cool program that tracks all of NASA's missions, um, and you can interact with it. It's almost like you're playing a video game uh, flying through the solar system. So Talia has uh, brought us up on the moon here, and you can see that it is pretty spherical. Um, objects in space have to have a certain amount of mass in order to be round. Uh, so the moon does have enough mass, but a lot of moons in the solar system, like if we think of Mars's moons, Phobos and Deimos, they're actually shaped more like lumpy potatoes because uh, they don't have enough mass in order to be round. And there are some objects that do kind of have that egg shape, like even the Earth in the, around the central equatorial region, it kind of bulges out a little bit. And that's just due to the Earth's rotation as well as gravitational forces from the moon. Um, but in general, I think it's it's pretty spherical. I don't know how big that, that bulge would be on the moon. Talia, do you know if there's a significant bulge? Um, I don't know. I know nothing in space is a perfect sphere. So the moon, although it is pretty spherical, it is definitely not perfectly round. I don't know how far away from a perfect sphere it is though. Good cool. question. Thank you. Um, here's one more, last one, and then I'll let you continue. How long does it take to travel from the Earth to the moon? Another great question. So uh, back in the Apollo times, the Apollo program, it took astronauts about three days to get to the moon. So that distance is a roughly 250,000 miles, just if you were to take a straight line from the Earth to the moon. 
but it's not really just as simple as going in a straight line as you saw in that diagram and you'll see in a couple more diagrams. Uh, usually the spacecraft is going to take a kind of long route to optimize the gravitational assistance from the Earth and the Moon to help propel the spacecraft there. So sometimes it'll make like a few orbits around the Earth first and then kind of swing over to the Moon and same thing on the way back. But yeah, it's about three days is uh, how long it takes. All right, awesome, great questions. I will pause at the end as well to take some more. Uh, but now we can talk about Artemis II, which is going to be the first crewed mission uh, using the Orion and the Space Launch System. Um, they are not landing on the surface of the moon. They are just going to do a flyby. But you can see on the kind of left part of this diagram, that green orbit there. So that's not quite, that, that happens before the spacecraft heads over to the moon, but that's called a high Earth orbit. And during that period, I believe it takes about 42 hours for um, the Orion capsule to go all the way around during that particular part of its orbit. Um, but during that time, it's going to be performing a lot of the tests that is is crucial to this mission. Um, so it's going to be checking out the life support systems of the Orion spacecraft, as well as the some docking mechanisms and uh, rendezvous out in space, things like that. So that's gonna be a very important part of the trip. And then they are going to fly by the moon. And this will be the first time that humans have been outside of low Earth orbit since 1972, which was the, the last Apollo mission to the moon. So that'll certainly be super exciting. Um, and there will be some CubeSats on this mission as well. I don't think that they have been decided yet, um, but it is gonna carry some CubeSats. So there's gonna be a lot of really awesome science done on this mission as well. And this one is supposed to launch in 2023, September of 2023. So two years from now, and fingers crossed that that mission does not get delayed, but who knows? <laughs> All right, uh, so the next one, which is probably the most exciting of these missions is Artemis III. Uh, this is the first trip of humans to the surface of the moon since the Apollo missions. Um, this diagram, again, it's got a lot of steps in it, um, but it, it will take about three days for them to get there. The whole mission in total is going to be about a month. So it will be faster than the mission, or excuse me, it will take a lot longer than the Apollo missions that didn't spend nearly as much time um, either on or around the moon. Um, there will be four astronauts on this trip. Three of them will be NASA astronauts, and one of them will be a Canadian astronaut from the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, there was a treaty signed, I think, about a year ago that, that between NASA and the Canadian Space Agency saying that uh, there would be a Canadian astronaut on board, so it'll be very exciting um, for both countries. And again, this will be the first woman and the first person of color to set foot on the moon, which will be extremely exciting. They haven't chosen the astronauts just yet, but there is a pool of them um, that could be chosen from. Uh, so we will see who is chosen probably in the next few years. So once the astronauts, they're in the Orion, they have been kind of propelled to lunar orbit. At that point, they are going to use a human landing system. So it's basically the equivalent of the lunar lander from the Apollo uh, missions, uh, but it'll be called the human landing system that takes them from the Orion to the surface of the moon. Um, the other option, so NASA is, is very hopeful that they will have a space station or at least the beginning parts of a space station in orbit around the moon before the launch of Artemis III. 
Right now, they're expecting Artemis 3 to launch in 2024, as well as the first components of the Lunar Gateway, which is the space station, the Lunar Space Station. Um, it is unclear as to whether or not those first few parts of this lunar space station will be in orbit around the moon before the launch of Artemis 3. So the human landing system is either going to be taking astronauts from the Orion spacecraft to the surface of the moon or from the first modules of the lunar gateway, the lunar space station, to the surface of the moon. They'll spend about a week on the surface of the moon and perform about four spacewalks. And so that human landing system is going to be, it's going to double as their home as well. So it's kind of like their, you know, their headquarters on the surface of the moon. And that system was just chosen to be developed by SpaceX, which is part of the reason that, um, there are some delays with Artemis 1 because uh, NASA is being sued by Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, because they wanted to make the uh, lunar lander. So there's all this drama going on right now, and it may delay these missions a little bit, hopefully, hopefully not too much. Um, but SpaceX has been the chosen partner for the human landing system as well as those first two modules of the Lunar Gateway. Uh, those will also be sent to the moon using a Falcon Heavy rocket, which is a SpaceX rocket. Um, all right, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about why they chose the uh, Lunar South Pole. So there is a spacecraft in orbit around the moon called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that is basically in a polar orbit around the moon. So it is able to uh, map the poles, polar regions of the moon really well. And the South Pole region is probably the most extensively thoroughly mapped part of the entire moon's surface because of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it's thought that there's a lot of water, well, it's known because of the LRO, that there's a lot of water um, in the form of ice in this part of the moon or on this part of the moon, as well as craters that are that presumably contain ice that has been shrouded in shadow for billions of years. So the moon is just slightly uh, tilted. And so the tilt combined with uh, being inside of a crater, like deep into a crater, there are some parts of the moon that have literally never seen sunlight. And so it's thought that there could be um, in these particular areas, they could there could be ice deposits, and that ice would be untouched by solar radiation um, or other you know geological processes throughout the past you know four billion years or so. So it could tell us a lot about the history of our solar system, as well as the formation of the moon, the relationship between the Earth and the moon. Um, right now, the, the current accepted hypothesis is that the Earth and the moon uh, are made of a lot of the same stuff because the moon formed from a collision between a massive object and the Earth. And so all of this material got sent out into space and coalesced into the moon that we see today that we all know and love. Um, it will also tell us a lot about the ancient sun. So in the parts that have been exposed to the sun, uh, because the surface of the moon has remained relatively unchanged, um, it is astronomers hope um, that they can find evidence of the history of the sun's solar activity. Um, so there's a lot of really cool science that is going to happen at the lunar south pole. And eventually, by the end of the decade, uh, there is hopefully going to be a lunar base built at the south pole called the Artemis Base Camp or something. I don't, I don't know if they have an official name for it just yet, but there is a base uh, that is going to be made in that region. Also, inside some of those craters, the coldest temperatures in the entire solar system have been recorded because they've never seen the sun. We're talking like negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit 
extremely, extremely cold in some of these regions. So it'll be absolutely fascinating um, for uh, astronauts to go and explore those regions. Um, a little bit more about the Lunar Gateway. So it is the International Space Station of the Moon, except it's going to be a lot smaller um, than the actual ISS. It's going to be just a, a, a few modules compared to the ISS, and it'll be a collaboration between NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and the European Space Agency. I don't believe that Roscosmos is going to be a part of this. Um, and like I said, it's going to be smaller, but it's going to be like this staging point or like this lunar outpost for astronauts to go if they're going to the moon. It's kind of like a stop to the moon, but also Mars. Gateway is being designed specifically with the intention of eventually sending astronauts to Mars. So that would kind of be like the first stop on the way out to Mars. Um, and just a slide ago, that was a picture of some astronauts on a mock-up of the Lunar Gateway, which is pretty cool. And then there are some artist renditions of the Lunar Gateway as well. All right. Uh, oh, and then I forgot about this one. So this is this is a slide that actually has some of the, the Artemis like base camp um, on it. So basically this whole program is not only to just get humans back to the moon, but to perform many experiments to eventually get humans to Mars. Um, so that's kind of the long game here, which is really exciting. All right, I'm going to stop there and see if there are more questions. Yeah, we do have one that says, is this mission going to new and unexplored places on the moon, or are we going back to where the Apollo missions were? Yeah, so the lunar south pole has never been touched by humans. Um, for the Apollo missions, they stayed relatively close to the equatorial regions. Um, so this is totally new territory for humans. Okay, cool. Um, I think I only have one more question. It was about the um, the cube sats that you were talking about earlier. They were wondering if those leave the capsule and then come back or do they kind of stay where they're housed? They So they get deployed uh, on the way to the moon. Um, they're not, and, and depending on what the actual mission of the specific CubeSat is, it, they might get deployed at different times. I'm actually not totally sure about that. But once they're deployed, I don't think that there's any intention of them coming back. There are communications with the CubeSats, um, from, you know, scientists on Earth that are monitoring whatever they're detecting and picking up. And I don't think they're supposed to come back. Um, Talia, do you know if there are any that have like sample returns or anything I like that? I highly doubt it. The entire design of a CubeSat is basically supposed to be cheap and easy to build. These are essentially disposable spacecraft. And they're really tiny. Like they could fit in the palm of your hand. They're like little, little tiny cubes, which is wow. kind of cute. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that from that picture that you're looking at. Cool. Well, thank yeah, you, these Katie. are like uh, combinations of like a whole of I think multiple ones in there. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> well, we are officially out of time. Um, so, Katie and Talia, do you folks want to say goodbye to everyone before we close out? Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As always, um, let me quickly put up my screen. Okay, so uh, if you are interested in checking out any of our other virtual offerings, you can go to mos.org slash mos at home. And then if you are interested in supporting the museum in any way, you can visit engage.mos.org slash welcome. So with that, we will hopefully see you all next Tuesday. Have a good one.